I feel like we should do a sports topic, but also we prepared 150 or so scouting reports on rules of etiquette that all speak I directly. I can't do this. I can't. I, I got. I've got in front of me. 500 papers, and I want to talk about everything on all of these lists. <laughs> what would you prefer? I, I'm down to do either. I mean, the football story isn't really a football story about the Dallas Cowboys, but it is certainly much more uh, connected to football than the etiquette stuff. No, I do. I wouldn't knock out the Cowboys story. I'm just, I was more asking you, how do you guys want to do this? There's too oh, much okay. here. okay. All right. So you're, what we're going to do. the host. Take control. Okay. This is, this is, this is me getting this <laughs> together. We're going to do the first story because this is a show that does stories in a share and tell format. Um, and then we're going to do a draft. And you're going to have to stick around through this very professionally executed tease and break to find out how that goes. We're on the air. <laughs> The first story I brought you is a story about etiquette, actually, and what's okay to do inside of a football facility. And for those who are just unfamiliar maybe with the culture of football, when I think about the culture of football inside a practice facility anywhere, I think about paranoia and confidentiality and privacy, right? These are state secrets. These are billion-dollar enterprises all competing to get tiny edges over each other. And what the Dallas Cowboys have been doing, as reported exhaustively and very cleverly by Kaylin Collar over on ESPN.com, is invite people onto tours multiple times a day, every day, Mina, of the star, right? So this is the Cowboys practice facility. No other team does it like this. They will do tours of stadiums. They'll do tours, but they will avoid deliberately the prospect that maybe you'll run into, in this case, in this story, on a 10 a.m., a uh, tour on a Friday before the Cowboys play the Lions, you'll see Dak Prescott three feet away from you in a hallway. You'll see Micah Parsons working out. And Jerry loves this. Of course, there are fees and prices. You can buy these tickets on SeatGeek, actually. That's the way Jerry Jones is doing it. No one else does it like this. And it turns out, spoiler alert, the Cowboys players, especially the former ones, we should say most clearly on the record, they think it gets in the way of actually, shockingly, winning football games. And it's just such a revealing story about the business of football as practiced by the most successful businessman in football. So this is a great story. I really recommend people reading it because Kaylin has so much great detail and she gets Jerry to talk about it. And yes. at one point, he says even negative attention, and he kind of can tell the direction she's going here, about these tours is good because it's more publicity for the tours, which is kind of Jerry Jones's business philosophy in a nutshell. All attention is good attention. Um, but in this case, it is, as you said, something that has really bothered the players. In fact, um, I first learned about the tours in the beginning of the year, it was actually in March of this year when Dalton Schultz, who was a Cowboys tight end, now he's with the Texans, uh, and this is mentioned in the story, he says he's kind of glad he's no longer there because it's a zoo. They've got a one-way mirror for people to like look at, like it's literally, it's a zoo, dude. <laughs> There's people <laughs> tapping on the glass, like trying to get people's attention as they're doing, you know, power cleans or whatnot. And it's just, it's different. And, and I mean, that's the brand that they've built. That's, you know, that's what Jerry Jones likes. That's the way that they run things. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, you don't realize like how many, you know, eyeballs and how, how much that can maybe, you know, distract from, you know, stuff just in the locker room being in the facility until you go somewhere else. That's the phenomena that Kaylin describes. I mean, there's... There's no world in, with this, in which this is a defensible way to run a workplace, any kind of workplace. It seems kind crazy. Of, I yeah. didn't realize it was like this. It seems crazy to me. But, but his, oh, but wait a minute. Yeah. But wait a minute. When you say there's no world where this is an acceptable world uh, workplace, no, there's Jerry's world. He gets to make the rules on commerce. And 
if you want to be a customer of his, you will do so under his conditions. All of us can object to it, but Jerry gets to make all the rules because Jerry has all the power. Jerry has all the money. He's the most powerful man in that sport, even though he hasn't won anything meaningful in 30 years. And largely, his team is as famous as it is and gets the ratings it does without excellence. Because he knows it's the zoo slash circus, and he's the ringleader, and he gets to make the rules on how the animals are treated. Like, and I and I don't like to say it that way, but if it's the circus, he's the carnival barker, he's the zookeeper, and the employees. No, you will not kneel uh, before a flag. You will not. No. And if I want to tap on the glass and have my customers watch you work out, I'm going to do that too. So here, this is what I want to actually get into because. The I said it's indefensible. The defense of it, the one that Jerry Jones would certainly mount, and the one that I think some folks around the NFL might agree with, is that it's good for business, right? There's no such thing as bad publicity. Exhibit A, look at this team. As Dan said, they're still the, you know, the biggest franchise in America. They're unbelievably successful, even without recent football success. I would push back on that. I, I actually don't agree with the idea that he's some brilliant businessman because like first of all I could buy an NFL team if, if ever in the 1990s um, crawl into a hole never come out and I would have instantly made a bazillion bazillion dollar return so there's that right the other thing is because the Cowboys were good in the 90s and it was such a formative period for the NFL and for fans I think a lot of this fan base is just legacy from that period. I don't really buy the idea that all of this circus and hoopla around the Cowboys are dramatically increasing the value of the franchise the way that I think some people do. I, am I wrong in, in well, positioning it that way? No, I think you're. I think that's the argument that Jerry himself is making unapologetically. By the way, what I will point out is that Jerry Jones is not just quoted in this piece in a in a really like almost nostalgically classic way in which an owner used to engage a reporter, Dan. I did this with Jerry in his office 25 years ago where he does the reporter thing of putting his hand on your knee and talking you through, yes, yes I'm in the entertainment business, son, and I'm here to, you know, do press conferences and do it my way and be the owner on the sideline. No one else does that. My team, my toy, I will do whatever it is that I wish with it. Part about this that gets objectionable for me is he allows the customers an access to private time because employees work for him and he's in charge of the of the entire business and he doesn't have a union that he answers to. It's, it seems very clearly bad. But I want to push back, Dan, on this idea that it's good business. I, I keep going back to this. Like, I, I, I understand, and Pablo, you said, like, the... the Jerry Jones was very forward-looking when it came to promoting this business in the 90s. Dan, you talked about, you know, interviewing him, and, and it was very deliberate, and no doubt it was effective. I do not think you can credibly argue that this kind of thing is actually— I understand that he says they made, like, what, $10 million a year off of it? I'm sure, whatever. But I do not think that these, like, small incremental gains he gets, whether it's attention or tickets sold, are actually— good for the Dallas Cowboys as an organization in the long term. I, I feel like it, that it's actually kind of a dated way of thinking about this team. Yeah, I want to clarify how the money is made here because Mina cited, you know, like an eight-figure return on this stuff. Um, $40 a tour, $70 for, quote, an authentic letter of fandom from Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, plus a souvenir tote, plus a pin, plus a coupon for the food and, you know, the gift shop. Uh, $90 as an add-on for a Q&A session with an AI version of Jerry Jones. That was the actual plot line in The Righteous Gemstones. <laughs> hey, y'all. Boy, I've missed worshiping with you. I'm so glad we get to do that today. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that like they tried yes. to sell oh them on God. making yes. a hologram right. this le right. but let me let me ask you Amina can I ask you before yeah. you continue Pablo uh 
If he can make $10 million, are you saying that it does more damage than $10 million? If we're doing this as simply math uh, business calculus, he's just arguing, uh, and you're saying what? You're going to lose free agents. You're going to lose humanity. Your players are going to not play for you during tough times because they don't like to be this, uh, you know, this much of a commodity. I think that, yeah, if you believe, as I do, that all of this is actually counterproductive to running, operating, building a successful football team, and I genuinely believe it is after hearing these players and seeing the product on the field and looking at what they do in free agency or what they don't do, right. then yes, I think you're actually eroding the long-term value of this franchise in pursuit of these small gains. I really Mina, believe that. But, but Mina, forgive me, Pablo, but Mina... If the goal's not winning, if success is measured in dollars and the standings are incidental, the Cowboys are an afterthought if we were doing just their record the last 30 years. He's doing this from a playbook that might be dated, but it obviously works. Like, winning isn't the... The point isn't winning. It's he's got the most valuable franchise. That stadium is the biggest on earth. He makes a ton of money and can push around Bob Kraft, even though Bob... Can keep Bob Kraft out of the Hall of Fame, even though Kraft's the one with all the recent titles. What I'm disputing is the idea that the value of the franchise is in any way tied to any of this bullshit. Pablo, do you disagree? Here's the argument that I'm going to make, which is that this, Mina, I think, has a case of thinking like a an actual football executive here. But, but I'm going to give a wrinkle there, right? Because if you're a football executive, it's very clear that this is not additive. You don't need the $10 million. You'd rather have players regard your organization as all of these sources that Kalen talks to on the record and off are saying... They they are enjoying not being with the Cowboys because no other team does this. And it's actively getting in the way of trying to win football games, which is the whole religion of, again, a football person. The business here that I think should be rooting for Jerry to remain stuck in this playbook is the media. Like, it's good for our business. Like, the, the case I want to make is that Jerry Jones, the guy who still is living in a version of reality where... He's the guy who put cameras in the draft room and the cameras have resulted, as he says in the story, in ratings that exceed the World Series, right? Jerry is also the guy, as he also famously did this month, who is still making local radio appearances with paid people who are like, you know, again, on his payroll, essentially. But these are antiquated things that all read down to the idea of if you're going to run a circus you are going to get attention. And the people who benefit more than the team at this point because they don't need it are the people who talk about this stuff. And actually, I think, as I said earlier, are nostalgic for an era when athletes and especially owners needed to be thirsty for your gaze. And that is that is absolutely changed otherwise. The media benefits, sure, but the person who benefits the most is Jerry Jones. I think that's why I get, like, my hackles go up a little bit when he's painted as this, like, brilliant businessman. And there's this idea, like, if he didn't do these tours and he wasn't in the front of the press so much, would anyone care about the Dallas Cowboys? He does it because he likes being a celebrity. He's not big braining everybody, right? Like, it's not like, oh, the Dallas Cowboys are only valued because unlike every single other team in the NFL, their GM never shuts the hell up. He does it because he loves being famous. That's it. I do think the wiring of this man is the actual answer to why all of this is happening. Mina, you know, said as much, right? He's addicted to celebrity and the spotlight. And just to give you a sense of this, right? This is both a look at me, Louie, and I will take the sounder. I deserve it. But I, like Dan, also had an... There it is. I, like Dan, had an encounter with Jerry Jones when I was like a fact checker, low-level reporter at Sports Illustrated. I was assigned to do a, a story on Miles Austin, right? So I'm in the building, and I am in, they put me in like post game in Jerry's box, and I see Jerry walk up, and he's led by Rich Dalrymple, his now former PR right-hand man, and Jerry does the thing that you've seen any like politician do before a diplomat. He leans over to Rich Dalrymple, who covers their mouths with like a uh, leather folio, and clearly Jerry is asking him, who the f is this guy? What's his name? And Jerry Jones, who I've never met before, says, Pablo, welcome. And I'm just like, he doesn't need to do this shit. But the way that he is wired is he actually does want attention and media to care about him. And what I'm expressing here is there is a last of his kind dynamic to Jerry Jones. 
There are lots of NFL owners that are greedy and morally compromised. But in terms of the sheer desire and the thirst for that attention, I'm going to miss this guy on that level because they don't need us. And that's the last guy who's pretending like he does. So can you help me how we're do how, explain to me how we're doing the draft are we selecting the ones of these that we want Yeah so just the way this is going to work we are now in the uh, etiquette war room okay so there are 150 or so of these rules post pandemic rules as laid out by the cut and I have prepared I have a big board I have takes I have prospects that I think you guys love that I hate I've gamed this whole system out so I think, Mina, we should start with you. <laughs> uh, well, I want to go first. Dan just wants wanna... to go first. He was trying okay, to sneak. Okay, fine. Sneak fine, it, yeah. fine. Well, Let big uh, Dan Levitard have the first overall pick. If you're dating adult, you should own lube. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good go pick. Go on. Go, you can't and just say it. that. You can't just drop well, that, 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 that and then that's, no, look, skulk this away. Is the, pro the, the problem I have is that I have 100 of these or more in front of me, and I think all of them are great. Uh, you may callously cancel almost any plans up until 2 p.m. I love that one as a discussion point because I don't know the right time to call someone or tell them I'm not coming to something. Uh, it's acceptable to tell any kind of lie in order to leave a drinks date. Any well, lie the, is you're, allowed. You're, you're drafting like three things. Yes. I, well, you well, need, I've got a hundred of them. I what, want to what, take a hundred of them. You don't have enough lube on your takes right now. You're just ramming this right in. I want to build a time machine and go back to before I heard both of you say the word lube in front of me. I know. I know. I and, did that purposefully, but it's unpleasant. I agree. <laughs> I mean... Would you like to start over? Because I, I'm looking at this no. and I've got no, a, no, a number no, no, of no, different no, no, pages. No, 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 no. You can't... No, no. No, you can't drop that and then smile and back away and let us wiggle with discomfort. Okay, no, you, it's, I've, no, no, I've no, never... No, 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 I've, no, you have to now give an opinion about that. Okay, so before reading this as number 18 out of the hundred or something others that were here, if you're a dating adult, you should own lube. It is not something that I had ever considered in any way before this that people were sitting around thinking about, talking about, considering. I am not someone who at any point in my life, and I did some dating, obviously, between 30 and 50. I regret Mina making him answer this. Between 30 and 50 had ever considered the idea of I should know this, that this is something that I should consider. So Dan can't even go. make yeah. for those not watching on YouTube for the draftings you network, asked. Dan made you zero asked. eye contact. That I had 20 answer. years of not knowing that I was supposed to be doing something that I was not doing. That With is, the second that is overall was. pick in the etiquette draft, Pablo Torres selects. Rule number 23, if you've met someone and they clearly don't remember your yeah, name, this is, this is on my say, list too. hi, oh, we've that. met, I'm Pablo. I'm fill in your own f name. We gotta, we gotta help each other out in these dynamics, right? Like, there have been so many times, Mina, <laughs> where you just gotta say it so that you avoid the just mutual awkwardness. What, you agree with this? I think you got to say it. Yes, yes, yes. I never say it. If I meet someone and they don't remember me, I never tell them that we've met before and because I don't want to make them uncomfortable. And I also feel like, what's to gain from that? Like, what is the benefit of pointing out because they're going to end up dancing around addressing you without your name. And you can take... I and mean, look, I, I, granted, yeah, this is also against I'm type Nina. for me. I it's just, great to see you. That's what I say. It's great to see you. Oh, okay. So Dan, uh, weigh in here because we're on opposite sides oh, of this. Oh, I've made a mistake though here. I See, this is when people... Uh, 
feel like I should know them because I get some of this, right? I've got the crappiest form, like you guys do, the crappiest form of the crappiest celebrity where actually you guys probably have a better form of it now because you're still on television. But what would happen to me a lot is that people would meet me and then meet me a second time and clearly expect me to remember the second time I'm meeting them. So when I would say, nice meeting you the second time, I'm now in a conversation for a long time about how I didn't remember the first time I saw them. They've already met me. And so it took me about 15 years to learn what Mina has already learned, which is good to see you. And and okay. just sort of, that that's good enough. Good to see you. Good. To, okay, so what I fully Great agree on you. is that it should always be see instead of meet. That, totally, totally. But in terms of like, hey, um, you know, you don't remember me. I do want to, I, I feel obliged to say like, yeah, hey, we've met. I'm Pablo. You know, like there's a way, there's, there's, there's a way to do it. The, the parallel rule that I will say um, before I hand it over to Mina for her pick is I, I think she's still mortified by you. I don't think she wants to leave just, here because no, yeah. it's mortifying. Look, 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 the rule, the 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 the, the other trick. You're that making I have, someone feel bad. You're that's, making that's someone. The thing. I'm actually very surprised, Dan, because I thought Pablo was like very aligned. We've talked about this on this very show, how we are constantly living this in is, fear of making other people uncomfortable. This is the product of a lot of work that I've done on myself. <laughs> Truly, <laughs> telling to be people like, we've met. <laughs> This is going to be have, a positive. This I is going to be you boundary I, setting. Okay. I exist, and I want you to acknowledge that you have met me existing before. The other rule, though, uh, in terms of like meeting people, is just always asking for their name, and then saying it back to them at the end of a conversation. I've done a lot of work on that because the payoff, guys, is tremendous. It's tremendous. This isn't about the name. This is not about the name. It's the shame. This is a question. This is a rule and a question and a topic that is in entirely about the concept of shame. Because when you do this, you risk shaming the other person. I once had someone do this to me very aggressively. And when we read it, I was like, oh, hey, great. Glad we worked together. This person, he said to me, yeah. We've met multiple times. Sorry, it was multiple times, I guess. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> am I going to come across as the villain of the story? I just realized. Yeah. Okay, sorry. He, but let me finish. He said, we've met multiple times. Guess I wasn't important enough for you to remember. Ooh, <laughs> I, yeah. my, I wish you could have seen like my soul leaving my body in that moment. Floating show to the show sky. me the lie. Show me the Mina. lie. <laughs> Mina, that is exactly what Pablo is doing more efficiently. He's doing the he, the delivery is the same. It's got an undercurrent that's the, that's of why yet, it's rule we, number We've already met before. Yeah, yeah. it's such an. Yeah. It's an. Move. I never do it, it to people for that. It's, I'm just so afraid of. We all deserve to. We all deserve to. Mina. Uh, I want to talk about this one because it's something that we have discussed a lot. That we both do a lot. That we do it for content. It's rule thirty nine. Don't tell people they look like other people. <laughs> this is on my list also. <laughs> uh, this is similar to the one you just discussed in that there is a very fine line and there's an incredible element of risk when you do this. Oh, God. So I do it when I believe it's flattering. However, there's not universal agreement about what a flattering comp is. So I could say... To Pablo, hey Pablo, you look like the Filipino guy in Miss Rachel. He might be Filipino. I think he is. It is, in fact, uh, a Filipino guy in that show. He has he has he has good bone structure, actually. I see. Um, I think that's a flattering comp, so I feel comfortable saying it. Dan, would you do you do that? Because you do it in work uh, all the time. It looks like Dan. He made a whole franchise about it. Uh, yes. And so I, yeah, I like, uh, looks like, but I can see where it might be dangerous around, uh, <laughs> dangerous certain, game. uh, it is a dangerous game. That's right. The looks like is a dangerous game. I agree with that. Pablo and I are responsible for this, probably the single most insulting Dan comp of all time during the, uh, -oh. uh, uh, pandemic era HQ. Do you remember this, Dan? I, I mean, you guys are always I don't know insulting if I, me, so... I don't, yeah, honestly, we've insulted Dan so much over pandemic era HQ that I don't know if I remember this. I've gotten Flounder from Animal House. I have gotten Chris Penn. I don't remember the one that you're about to hit me with. It was... <laughs> Hugo from Lost 
Hurley. <laughs> oh, yes. I remember right. this now. Right. Yes. Yeah, this is a good one. It's a good one. They'll put it up on the screen and everyone will yeah. agree with this. And I deserve this. And uh, yes, it's yeah. a good one. I I agree. So uh, you, as far as we'll put a bow on this, unflattering comps, you can do it to yourself, right? I can't tell Pablo you look like XYZ. I don't know. I can think of something. But I can say because it's funny that I look like a young Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> or Tim Lincecum. Although it was, Tim Lincecum uh, is, is yeah. dead on. Yeah. Noted half Filipino, I mean, Tim Lincecum, incidentally. It's, this, it's for those just accurate. Keeping score as big baseball. But if fan. you say that, that is crossing the line. All right, Dan, you're Forg- up next. Forgive me, guys. Forgive me, because I've been listening to you, but I am just going through all of these because I want to do so many of them. So just for your perusal, I'm going to say white people should always clearly pronounce 50 cent. <laughs> He's not fitty to you. I'm just going to throw that out yeah, there. We We're not going to do that, that one. Yeah. Except that, yeah. uh, do, do not touch the small of my back to move around me at the bar if you're ugly. <laughs> If you're ugly was also a qualifier I, I wasn't expecting <laughs> on that one. Uh, this one I was stunned by. Uh, number 38. Always wink. Just that always wink. Yeah. I, that Yes. To wink at people as a way to be charming or I, I just didn't think that always wink would be uh, on there. This one, Mina, I've done I've before. Winked. Number 35. Don't address two or more women as ladies. I, I have done that before. That is something I've done. I'm going to say not, not like I'm like I'm a gentleman, like I'm Sean Connery. Eight, uh, ladies, like in, 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 in a different time, I have done that. I'm ashamed to say it. Um, and this one, I loved this one. If your friend is dating someone you seriously object to, you have one shot to sit your pal down and say Love so. Love that one. The, Love uh, that one. Sto- the, well, I want to get your opinions on this, but we'll tell you the most amazing story about it. One time, because people listen to our show in a way that uh, is intimate, I got advice. I, I got a listener of ours came up at one of these settings and just simply asked me, what do we do? We need advice. A group of us don't like uh, the woman our our friend is about to marry. It's about six dudes that are asking my opinion on this. I don't know how to answer their question. But the next day on the radio show, we had a sports guest call in and we asked that person the question. And he sliced right through it. He's like, y'all get together, you pick the best guy, you tell your friend once, one time only on behalf of uh, him, one time only, and you get out of it. It was as if this person had considered this and and had it happened to him, and that person, Lamar Odom, went on to marry <laughs> a Kardashian, and uh, it happened before all of that, and so I submit to you guys, Ugh. this seems like great advice. Would you agree to it? That's incredible, first of all. Um, right. The intervention, yeah, the, yeah. the attempted intervention, Mina. Yeah. I've been part of one. Uh, I had a, a really good friend who was dating a really horrible woman, like a, a possibly a compulsive liar, very like rude. Nobody liked her. And all of, uh, I would say, his four best friends at the time, which I was one of them, we had like a, a big meeting. It was like a, like a mafia, like meeting of the four families where we discussed how do we do this as a group? How do we do an intervention? And we actually came to a different conclusion, which was that each individually, each one of us had to say something oh, so that wow. he would feel the way. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. That is, that is a burial. Like, you are changing that person's relationship. Like, you're changing that way that the person... It how they feel bad. about someone? What, right? Like, I mean, it was that bad. If, but but if you have more, if you have multiple friends coming yeah. to do this, it's going to actually impact the relationship or, or some of the relationships. I don't think I've ever had that happen to me. No one's ever tried to intervene with any of my relationships. I have a uh, another draft pick that I'm okay. going to segue to because this is also about how. Uh, wh- Stop trying to wink. <laughs> it's not working. I just don't, I just it's feel really like they might not, not be able to. <laughs> Always on. wink. Let's see what we've got here. She doesn't know how to do it. She's doing it incorrectly. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're supposed to like. Hold on, hold on. No, left eye's better. No. So I can't wink with my right eye. Look, I have to say something sassy, like, nice work. 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that was sassy. That qualifies as sassy. Nice work with the <laughs> Pablo, it's never too late to send a condolence note. Never too late. That's I disagree not, with that's that. That's not what I was going to draft. That's Stop weird. trying to bring us to grief, okay? <laughs> Jesus. Um, you found mine, his way there. Mine was going to be like, oh, wait, what was it? Oh, no. It, yep, 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 yep. The emotional truffle pig has found a draft pick. That's what that was. Mine, mine was in the realm of gestures. Find your signature sign off and stick with it, right? Ooh. And there's a follow-up addendum to this, but if you can't find your way, consider, quote, as always, sign your name. I like that. So the thing here to point out is that everybody is trying to strain to say all the best or what, you know, thanks, exclamation point. I might steal as always. I like as oh, always. That's so pompous. Come as on. As always. always Pablo. <laughs> Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Can you imagine emailing us and being like, yeah, guys, let's, uh, I think Jerry Jones' story is a good idea today. Let's draft some etiquettes, as always, Pablo Torres. I'm trying to think, what? Lena, I like the sound of, of, the, of the most pompous way you can say nothing about yourself. He, uh, the, the regards. At, I mean, yes, regards is heavy handed here, <laughs> well, but you guys, as like, you guys always, like cheers, you like cheers, Dan. You like that better I than know, as always? No. I go gracias. I just say I just say thank you. Uh, mm. Like uh, as always seems. Come on. Do you do wait wait, wait 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 wait? Do you do entire emails in English and then just sign off with like yes, gracias? Sometimes yes. <laughs> sometimes I do that as the punctuation. That, that is that's called that's called an ethnic wink. By the way. <laughs> Can you imagine if I emailed everyone and I was like, yeah, 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 I've been looking at Run Past Concepts, RPOs are really up, and da, da, da. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can we skip the lube topic? Mabuhai, Pablo. I love that. I please, please make that something that. Uh, come on, make that more popular than as always. As always has had. My guess is if you look this up, as always has had a hundred year run as uh, as being used that way. Let's do this. Let's change the way the culture works. By the way, I don't, speaking of like, you know, crisscrossing nationality or whatever, I don't like it when Americans say cheers. I think it's it's like you're you're not British. Yeah. You know, like, come on. I'm with you on it's that. It's like my, my other incredible pet peeve when um, white people, of which I am half one, cheers saying salute. <laughs> yeah, so much. <laughs> 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 Somewhere, the uh, OutKick interns who are being assigned to watch every yes. minute of these podcasts yes. just got to minute yes. 45, and they're like, oh, yes. she said white people. <laughs> so I have one here at number 26. If someone mis mispronounces a word, but you knew what they meant, move along. I will always correct people, and I feel like an for it right now. As I tell you, mm. I will always make the correction, but I do it. I genuinely do it because I think the person would want to know so that it doesn't keep happening to them later on. Do you do like it on if air? I was trying to remember if you ever, because yeah, I say stuff wrong all the time. Yeah, I was going to well, say, I Mina, uh, well, yeah, I mean, Dan, yeah. speaking of pandemic era HQ, remember that show we did where you looked like Hurley from Lost and Mina did not know what a baby horse was called and she kept on referring to it as a fowl? Yes. Should be pronounced foul. Foul is a horse! A foal? A foal, not a f Mina. Look at Mina. what I'm saddled with here. Yes, we got stuck there. Yes. Are you going to roll the footage of that, Pablo? We already did. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, keep up with the times, Mina. Come on. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Foal, foal, foal. Jesus. <laughs> I learned a lot of my vocabulary from books. Don't shame me. <laughs> I, Mina, I, Matt Kelleher still makes fun of me because one of the first times I appeared on PTI, I referred to it as an athlete having a stylistic athlete having a certain panache, a <laughs> uh, certain uh, panache, panache instead of panache. Yes. Did you see that video of Aaron Rodgers 
saying we're we're Dan- not something like Danu- the Ma. of the season. <laughs> I was like, us. that dude, that dude just read that <laughs> off of his word a day calendar is what that felt like. <laughs> he really leaned into the Frenchiness. That's what makes it sing, you know? He did. And admittedly, <laughs> I was grading him on whether he pronounced it correctly, and he did. He did, yeah. It's just very funny when people lean into French words. All right, am I up? We. Oui. <laughs> okay. Oh, so many. You look like Michelle Wee. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Not at <clears throat> all, obviously. Oh, that's a compliment um, in my book. Okay. <laughs> this, there's so many of these are actually, now that I realize this, a lot of mine are similar and it's interesting because the a lot of ours are similar. I I had, if someone starts telling you a story you've heard before, you have two seconds yep. to tell them. Yep. So again, similar. On my big board underlying tension here, which is shame, right? Like, you don't want to shame the person telling the story, but you also don't want to have to sit through the same story. That's right. It depends on how long the story is. This this I'm not good at. I've not done nearly enough work on myself to get to this point. I am the person who will happily grin and nod through a story I have heard a half dozen times before. Same. I'd, Except, I'd yeah. want to be told. I'd want to be, if if I've told you a story before and I'm in the middle of telling it again, I would want to be stopped before I tell. Like, I would Nina want that is help. Suppressing so many just spicy, spicy comments about you observing that. I have let Dan do this a lot to me. I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. I'm that person. I'm, I now look because you're being polite. You haven't yeah. helped me be a better person because this, I'm in reruns oh with you. Boy. Oh I boy. hate that I'm in reruns. <laughs> this does remind me, though, of another rule that made me think of Mina, which is she is the only person who practices this in my life, which is that it's uh, rule number 129. Hot gossip only goes in the voice memo, never in text. Mm, I have a lot of people in my life who do this, so... I don't know. I might just know more no know more paranoid people. Or you're just a hub of gossip, which is also I do I love I do love gossip. I don't yeah. think people know um, this about you, Mina. I don't think people know that you're a gossip. I think they'd be surprised to learn that you're a gossip. Pablo, you're a gossip too. You love I'm gossip. I'm a reporter. <laughs> oh wow. He really just did that to you. He hides his every uh, idiosyncrasy and flaw under some shield of nobility. Do you guys trust someone who doesn't gossip? Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) There should be a rule that is never made that You should have winked. Yes, I thought thought you were going to end that with a wink. I thought that... You were gonna be sassy. Still working on the timing of the No, it is is true. Like at this point with Mina, I had just have, and both of you guys, honestly, we just have like compromise on each other. So we're all just like mutually assured destruction. Like if one of us betrays the other, we're all. She had it sold though. That would have been so memeable. Her confidently hitting the wink at the end of that. I've got one more. I threw away all my hundreds of papers. I don't know which rule it was, but you're not allowed to talk to your animal in your private voice in public. Uh, How do you guys feel about this one? Because I talk, uh, I keep that private. That's not something anyone has ever seen from me publicly. Well, now I'm paranoid that I've told this story before. (laughs) But are you aware of the Lenny voice on my show, Dan? So uh, I am not. For the first, no. well, thanks for listening. For the first, uh, I see. she only what does it I have every single there? episode. <laughs> what should, no, what no, should I don't do it every episode? So the, the, the backstory is: so I, like many people, I have a, a voice that I use to talk to my dog. It's high pitched. I used to end every episode where Lenny got one question, and it was a rude, a purposefully rude question, and I would do it in that voice. And there were pretty offensive questions, to be honest. The one that broke me was I had Matt Hasselbeck on the show. Okay, last question. Um, So like I said, I'm going to read this in my dog's voice. I can't believe I'm doing this. I apologize in advance. Please don't. um, Yeah, okay. This is a question for my dog. Matt, was Super Bowl XL the worst officiated game in NFL history or just one of the top five worst officiated games in NFL history? Can I go back to that Dallas Philly game that I saw the other night? Huh? The just utter shame and self-loathing 
that washed over my body. I could never do it again. And it is the number one complaint I get about my podcast is bring back the Letty voice. People, Nina, in fact, I've been told I silenced Letty. Yeah, we got to bring that back. We got to bring it's that back. It's weird that it's such a high pitched voice because Lenny's from Alabama. So you would think I would do one of my spectacular Southern accent. But um, before she can do that, the voice I'm going to go and draft another thing, which is uh, never answer a compliment with a compliment. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm totally down to do that. So this is, so this is the influence of Dominique Foxworth, who has policed me. I used to do this. Dominique would call me up and it's a big thing when Dominique says something nice to you. And he says like, nice show. I just listened to it. And I say, oh yeah, man, I also liked what you did. And he's like, take a call. Hangs up. And he hangs up. And he's, I'm like, what? I, I just wanted to also say something nice to you. And he's like, that was obviously something that you manufactured. Because I said something nice to you. You didn't mean that. And this rule number 24 <laughs> is entirely about how someone, uh, yeah, like uh, someone had told her, uh, I like your pants. And they panicked and said, I like your glasses. And it was just totally obviously just the thing that no one actually believed. And it was Dominique horrible. Foxworth could stand to read some of these, including number 122, don't ever message someone K. So... <laughs> That's on my list, too. Dominique. Yeah. He yeah. values authenticity, though. Are we in agreement that he values, like, he doesn't want that compliment. Why would he want your bogus compliment well, that was just said maybe because he gave bogus. you a compliment? No, but, he, but it, it, it might not be bogus, but if it's, I believe uh, Pablo to be a charming bullshit. And I don't believe you. Dominique has got any Wait. time for, to be deceived by your charming bullshit. This is leading me to a corollary, which is rule number 123. And Dominique violates this too. If you're someone who types ha 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 to things that are actually funny, don't just say ha when they're clearly not. Oh, yeah. That's a big Dominique one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we're noticing the demotion I don't think I've ever there. gotten more than two ha's max from him. I don't think I've ever gotten an LOL, an LMAO, a three ha, never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why. I, that's why I've gone. I've gone to. I've gone to LOL. I'm just a LOL guy now. Because I don't think Dan we, has ever expressed amusement over. Yeah, text. Dan never. Ne are, Dan never gives it up on text. He never. Are we laughs. thirsting for haws from oh, Dominique Foxworth? Yeah. I'm, I'm thirsting, thirsting, I'm thirsting for, for he's Ooh, and for haws. Let me look at my text with him. That sounded weird. Um, Let's cut that first part. I'm thirsting no, for haws. <laughs> no, it didn't sound weird. That. You should be thirst. No, it should stay in. You are thirsting for he's and for haws. Uh, I am not. I'm not good. I have realized with positive reinforcement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this leads me to a thing I also thought about with Dan. This was a Dan rule where it was um, number one hundred. If you're a boss and you see your employees in the wild, greet them warmly but briskly. <laughs> like say hello. <laughs> Five minutes it's of only, engaged conversation. Only from Dominique. Not a single ha ha ha. Uh, <laughs> Dan, can I give you a little bit of um, feedback on that one? The positive Please. reinforcement. And and yes, I, I would like that. And I would also like for you uh, going forward, anytime I'm two seconds into a story you've already heard before, <laughs> I insist you stop me on the spot. It doesn't happen that often. Um, <clears throat> That's I feel like, Pablo, you can tell me what you think. There's a vast spectrum when it comes to positive reinforcement and compliments from radio silence to you are the greatest person to ever do this and you deserve millions and millions of dollars. And you really live on both ends and maybe you could live in the <laughs> middle a little bit. <laughs> Dan um, is either with, always recommending you for a job you didn't ask for a recommendation for. Or I guess what I'm saying is like, how about some, yeah. It's just radio praise. silence. Yeah. Just some yeah, intermediate yeah. praise. What have I learned this week? 
What have I learned? We, we've done this forced and inauthentic at the end of these podcasts every week where uh, Pablo is assigning you have to have learned something instead of we just made 50 minutes of television. Correct. I just learned that my most confident friends or who I view as the best friends that I have in this business at making amazing things, that they too need compliments in a way that Dominique Foxworth does not. Uh, he does not care about your haws if they are insincere. Uh, I don't know if he cares about about your compliments that much if uh, if he is sincere. But you just taught me that I have to be better at something that I'm, I'm just recently realizing that I have not been good at positive reinforcement. So thank you for that. I will be better about expressing to you and to others uh, how much uh, how, how much I admire the work you guys do and the things that you are. No, 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 no. Just gently. <laughs> you don't have to be super effusive. That's it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not that I want to be clear. It's not that you don't do it. You are the greatest cheerleader on earth. But a little, sometimes a simple, hey, that was good, will suffice. Just, in other words, just a little bit of lube. Just oh, a little. I knew bit. he was going to bring that back. I oh, knew it man. and I dreaded e, it this entire e, time. E, e, I'd forgotten all about that. I'd forgotten <sighs> all about that. You know, so, Mina, what did you find out on Pablo Torre Finds Out, a show about finding stuff out? I'm not sure I can wink. Mm. Yeah, it does look you like you almost just have had it. like a medical thing. An allergy. Yeah, an allergy yeah. of some sort. Like you're, yes, either an, uh, you're allergic to uh, to bees and peanuts. It's 2 a.m. Looking across the bar and this hits you. What do you do? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I do. I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> oh, don't, don't try. No, no. This has been Pablo Torre Finds Out, a Metal Arc Media production. And we are produced by Walter Avaroma, Ryan Cortez, Sam Daywig, Juan Galindo, Patrick Kim, Neely Lohman, Rob McRae, Rachel Miller Howard, Ethan Schreier, Carl Scott, Matt Sullivan, Chris Tuminello, and Juliet Warren. Our studio engineering by RG Systems. Our sound design by NGW Post. Our theme song, as always, by John Bravo. And we will talk to you next time. <laughs>